Let me begin by saying it is a great pleasure to welcome President Park uh, and our friends from the Republic of Korea. Uh, Madam President, we are greatly honored uh, that you've chosen the United States as your first foreign visit. Uh, this, of course, reflects the deep friendship between our peoples and the great alliance between our nations, which is marking another milestone. Uh, I'm told that in Korea, uh, a 60th birthday is a special celebration of life and uh, longevity. Uh, Juan Gat. Uh, well, this year we're marking the 60th anniversary of the defense treaty between our nations. Uh, yesterday, President Park visited Arlington National Cemetery and our memorial to our Korean War veterans. Uh, tonight, she's hosting a dinner to pay tribute to the generation of American veterans who have served in the defense of South Korea. And tomorrow, she'll uh, address a joint session of Congress, uh, an honor that is uh, reserved for our closest of friends. And in this sense, this visit also reflects South Korea's extraordinary progress over these six decades. From the ashes of war uh, to one of the world's largest economies, from a recipient of foreign aid to a donor that now helps other nations develop, uh, and of course around the world people are being swept up by uh, Korean culture, uh, the Korean wave, uh, and uh, as I mentioned to President Park, uh, my daughters have uh, have taught me a pretty good Gangnam style. Uh, President Park, in your first uh, months uh, in office, South Korea has faced threats and provocations uh, that would test any nation, uh, yet you've displayed calm and steady resolve uh, that has defined your life. Like people around the world, those of us in the United States have uh, also been inspired by your example as the first female president of South Korea. Uh, and today I've come to appreciate the leadership qualities for which you are known. Uh, your focus and discipline and straightforwardness, and I very much thank you for the progress uh, that we've already made together. Uh, today we agreed to continue the implementation of our historic uh, trade agreement, which is already yielding benefits for both our countries. Uh, on our side, we're selling more exports to Korea, more manufactured goods, more services, more agricultural products. Uh, even as we have a long way to go, our automobile exports are up nearly 50 percent in our big three. Uh, Ford, Chrysler, and GM are selling more cars in Korea. Uh, and as President Park and I agreed to make sure that we uh, continue to fully implement this agreement, uh, we believe that it's going to make both of our economies more competitive. It will boost U.S. exports by some $10 billion in support of tens of thousands of American jobs, and obviously it will be creating jobs in Korea uh, as they are able to uh, continue to do extraordinary work in uh, expanding their economy uh, and moving it further and further up the, uh, the value chain. Uh, we agreed to continue the clean energy partnerships that help us to enhance our energy security and address climate change. Uh, given the importance of uh, a peaceful uh, nuclear energy industry to South Korea, we recently agreed to extend the existing civilian nuclear agreement between our two countries, uh, but we also emphasized in our discussions uh, the need to continue to work diligently towards a new agreement. As I told the President, I believe that we can find a way to support South Korea's energy and commercial needs, even as we uphold our mutual commitments to prevent nuclear proliferation. We agreed to continuing modernizing our security alliance. Guided by our joint vision, we're investing in the shared capabilities and technologies and missile defenses that allow our forces to operate and succeed together. Uh, we are on track for South Korea to assume operational control for the alliance in 2015, and we're determined to be fully prepared for any challenge or threat to our security, and obviously that includes the threat from North Korea. If Pyongyang thought its recent threats would drive a wedge between South Korea and the United States or somehow garner the North uh, international respect, uh, today is further evidence that North Korea has failed uh, again. President Park and South Koreans have stood firm with confidence and resolve. The United States and the Republic of Korea are as united as ever, and faced with new international sanctions, North Korea is more isolated than ever. Uh, in short, uh, the days when North Korea could create a crisis and elicit concessions, uh, those days are over. Uh, our two nations are prepared to engage with North Korea diplomatically and over time build trust. But as always, and as President Park has made clear, uh, the burden is on Pyongyang uh, to take meaningful steps to abide by its commitments and obligations, particularly the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and we discussed uh, that Pyongyang should take notice of events in 
countries like Burma, which as it reforms is seeing more trade and investment and diplomatic ties with the world, including the United States and South Korea. Uh, for our part, uh, we'll continue to coordinate closely with South Korea and with Japan. Uh, and I want to make clear the United States is fully prepared and capable of defending ourselves and our allies with the full range of capabilities available, including the deterrence provided by our conventional and nuclear forces. As I said in Seoul last year, the commitment of the United States to the security of the Republic of Korea will never waver. More broadly, we agreed to continue expanding our cooperation globally. Uh, in Afghanistan, where our troops serve together and where South Korea is a major donor of development assistance, uh, we're on track to complete the transition to Afghan-led operations by the end of next year. Uh, we discussed Syria, where both our nations are working to strengthen the opposition and plan for a Syria without Bashir Assad. Uh, and I'm pleased that our two nations and our Peace Corps have agreed to expand our efforts to promote development around the world. Uh, finally, we're expanding the already strong ties between our young people. Uh, as an engineer by training, President Park knows the importance of education. Uh, Madam President, you've said, uh, and I'm quoting you, we live in an age where a single individual can raise the value of an entire nation. Uh, I could not agree more, so I'm pleased that we're renewing exchange programs that bring our students together. And as we pursue common sense immigration reform here in the United States, we want to make it easier for foreign entrepreneurs and foreign graduate students from countries like Korea to stay and contribute to our country, uh, just as so many Korean Americans already do. So uh, again, thank you, President Park, for making the United States your first foreign trip. Uh, in your inaugural address, you celebrated the can-do spirit of the Korean people. That is a spirit that we share. And after our meeting today, I'm confident that if our two nations continue to stand together, there's nothing we cannot do together. So Madam President, welcome to the United States. Let me start by thanking President Obama for his invitation and his gracious hospitality. During my meeting with the President today, I was able to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him on a wide range of common interests. I found that the two of us have a broad common view about the vision and roles that should guide the Korea-U.S. alliance as it moves forward, and I was delighted to see this. First of all, the President and I shared the view that the Korea-U.S. alliance has been faithfully carrying out its role as a bulwark of peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and in Northeast Asia, and that the alliance should continue to serve as a linchpin for peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and in Asia. In this regard, I believe it is significant that the joint declaration on the 60th anniversary of our alliance we adopted spells out the direction that our comprehensive strategic alliance should take. Next, the President and I reaffirm that we will by no means tolerate North Korea's threats and provocations, which have recently been escalating further, and that such actions would only deepen North Korea's isolation. The President and I noted that it is important that we continue to strengthen our deterrence against North Korea's nuclear and conventional weapons threat, and share the view that in this respect, the transition of wartime operational control should also proceed in a way that strengthens our combined defense capabilities and preparations be made toward that way as well. We also share the view that realizing President Obama's vision of a world without nuclear weapons should start in the Korean Peninsula, and we stated that we would continue to strongly urge North Korea in close concert with the other members of the six-party talks and the international community to faithfully abide by its international obligations under the September 19th Joint Statement and the relevant Security Council resolutions. Korea and the U.S. will work jointly to induce North Korea to make the right choice through multifaceted efforts, including the implementation of the Korean Peninsula trust building process that I had spelled out. I take this opportunity to once again send a clear message. North Korea will not be able to survive if it only clings to developing its nuclear weapons at the expense of its people's happiness. Concurrently pursuing nuclear arsenals and economic development can by no means succeed. 
this is the shared view of the other members of the six party talks and the international community. However, should North Korea choose the path to becoming a responsible member of the community of nations, we are willing to provide assistance together with the international community. We also had meaningful discussions on the economy and ways to engage in substantive cooperation. The President and I welcome the fact that the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement, which went into effect one year ago, is contributing to our shared prosperity. We also said we will make efforts to enable our people to better feel the benefits of our free trade agreement for them. I highlighted the importance of securing high-skilled U.S. work visas for Korean citizens and asked for executive branch support to the extent possible to see to it that the relevant legislation is passed in the U.S. Congress. Moreover, we arrived at the view that the Korea-U.S. Civil Nuclear Energy Cooperation Agreement should be revised into an advanced and mutually beneficial successor agreement. We said we would do our best to conclude our negotiations as soon as possible. The President and I also had in-depth discussions on ways to enhance our global partnership. First, we noted together that Northeast Asia needs to move beyond conflict and divisions and open a new era of peace and cooperation and that there would be synergy between President Obama's policy of rebalancing to Asia and my initiative for peace and cooperation in Northeast Asia as we pursue peace and development in the region. We shared the view about playing the role of co-architects to flesh out this vision. Furthermore, we decided that the Korea-U.S. alliance should deal not just with challenges relating to the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia, but confronting the broader international community. I am very delighted that I was able to build personal trust with President Obama through our summit meeting today and to have laid a framework for cooperation. Thank you. All right, we've got uh, a couple of questions from each, uh, each side, so we'll start with uh, Stephen Collison of uh, AFP. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, does the United States have a core national security interest in stopping the slaughter in Syria or merely a strong moral desire to see the violence end? Um, and at what point does the cost of not intervening in a more direct way than you have done so far um, outweigh the cost of doing so? And if I may ask President Park, President Obama's critics have warned that failing to act on perceived violations of U.S. red lines in Syria could uh, embolden U.S. enemies elsewhere, including in North Korea. Uh, are you convinced that uh, Kim Jong-un uh, has taken the U.S. and South Korean warnings seriously? And do you see the withdrawal of two missiles from a test site as a sign that he's willing to de-escalate the situation? Well, um Stephen, I, I think that we have both a moral obligation and a national security interest in uh, A, ending the slaughter in Syria, but B, also uh, ensuring that we've got a stable Syria that is representative of all the Syrian people uh, and uh, is not creating chaos for its neighbors. Uh, and that's why, for the last two years, we have been active in trying to uh, ensure that uh, Bashir Assad uh, exits uh, the stage and that we can begin a political transition process. Um, that's the reason why we have invested so much in humanitarian aid. That's the reason why we are uh, so invested in helping the opposition why we've mobilized the international community uh, to isolate uh, Syria. Uh, that's why we are now providing non-lethal assistance to the opposition, and that's why we're going to continue uh, to do the work that we need to do. Uh, and in terms of the costs uh, and the benefits, uh, I think there'd be severe costs in doing nothing. That's why we're not doing nothing. That's why we are actively invested in the process. Uh, if what you're asking is, uh, uh, are there uh, continuing reevaluations about 
what we do, what actions we take in conjunction with other international partners uh, to optimize the day when, or to, uh, to hasten the day when we can see uh, a better situation in Syria. We've been doing that all along and we'll continue to do that. Uh, I think that understandably, uh, there's a desire for easy answers. That's not the situation there. Uh, and uh, my job is to constantly measure uh, our very real and legitimate humanitarian and national security interests in Syria, uh, but measuring those against uh, my bottom line, which is what's in the best interests of America's security, uh, and uh, making sure that I'm making uh, decisions not based on uh, a hope and a prayer, uh, but on hard-headed analysis in terms of what will actually make us safer uh, and stabilize the region. Uh, I would note, not to answer the question that uh, you uh, lobbed over to uh, President Park, that you s suggested, uh, even in your question, a perceived crossing of a red line. Um, the operative word there, I guess, Stephen, is perceived. And what I've said is that we have evidence that there has been uh, the use of chemical weapons inside of Syria, but uh, I don't make decisions based on perceived, and I can't organize international coalitions around perceived. Uh, we've tried that in the past, by the way, and it didn't work out well. So we want to make sure that uh, you know, we have the best analysis possible. We want to make sure that uh, we are acting deliberately, uh, but uh, I would just point out that uh, there have been several instances during the course of my presidency where I said I was going to do something, and it ended up getting done. And there were times when uh, there were folks on the sidelines wondering why hasn't it happened yet, and what's going on, and why didn't it go on tomorrow. And, uh, but in the end, uh, whether it's bin Laden or Gaddafi, uh, if we say uh, we're taking a position, uh, I would think at this point the international community has a pretty good sense that we typically follow through uh, on our commitments. With regard to actions towards Syria, what kind of message would that communicate to North Korea? That was the question. And recently, North Korea seems to be de-escalating its threats and provocations. What seems to be behind that? You asked these two questions. In fact, North Korea is isolated at the moment. So it's hard to find anyone that could really accurately fathom the situation in North Korea. Its actions are also very unpredictable. Hence, whether the Syrian situation would have an impact it's hard to say, for sure. Why is North Korea appearing to de-escalate its threats and provocations? There's no knowing for sure, but what is clear, and what I believe for sure, is that the international community, with regard to North Korea's bad behavior, its provocations, must speak with one voice, a firm message, and consistently send a firm message that they will not stand, and that North Korea's actions in breach of international norms will be met with so-and-so sanctions and measures by the international community. At the same time, if it goes along the right way, there will be so-and-so reward. So if we consistently send that message to North Korea, I feel that North Korea will be n left with no choice but to change. And instead of just hoping to see North Korea change, the international community must also consistently send that message with one voice to tell them and communicate to them that they have no choice but to change and to shape an environment where they are left with no choice but to make the strategic decision to change. And I think that's the effective and important way. My question goes to President Park. You just mentioned that North Korea, in order to induce North Korea to abandon its nuclear weapons, what is most important is the concerted actions of the international community. With regard to this, 
during your meeting with President Obama today, I would like to ask what was said and the views that you shared. And with regard to this, what Russia and China, um, the role that they're playing in terms of inducing North Korea to uh, abandon its nuclear weapons, how do you feel about that? My next question is to President Obama. Regarding the young leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, I would appreciate your views about the leader of North Korea. And if you were to send a message to him today, what kind of message would you send to him? With regard to the North Korea issue, Korea and the United States, as well as the international community, the ultimate objective that all of us should be adopting is for North Korea to abandon its nuclear weapons and to induce it to become a responsible member of the international community. This serves the interests of peace on the Korean Peninsula and the world, and it also serves the interests of North Korea's own development as well. That is my view. And so, so in order to encourage North Korea to walk that path and change its perceptions, we have to work in concert. And in this regard, China's role, China's influence can be extensive. So if so China taking part in these endeavors is important, and we shared views on that. With regard to China and Russia's stance, I believe that China and Russia, not to mention the international community, of course, share the need for a denuclearized Korean Peninsula and are cooperating closely to induce North Korea to take the right path. In the case of China, with regard to North Korea's missile fire and nuclear testing, China has taken active part in adopting uh, UN Security Council resolutions and is faithfully implementing those resolutions. And with regard to Russia, Russia is also firmly committed to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And with regard to the adoption of UN Security Council resolutions on North Korea, it has been very active in supporting them, and they've also sent a very, and they've also worked very hard to include a stern message to North Korea in the joint statement of the G8 foreign ministers meeting. Such constructive efforts on the part of China and Russia are vital to sending a unified message to North Korea that their nu nuclear weapons will not stand and encouraging and urging North Korea to make the right decision. Obviously, I don't know uh, Kim Jong-un personally. Uh, I haven't had a conversation with him. Can't really give you an opinion about uh, his personal characteristics. What we do know is uh, the actions that he's taken uh, that have been provocative uh, and seem to pursue uh, a dead end. Uh, and I, I want to emphasize, uh, President Park and myself very much share the view that we are going to maintain a strong deterrent capability, uh, that we're not going to reward uh, provocative behavior, but we remain open to the prospect of North Korea taking uh, a peaceful path of denuclearization, uh, abiding by international commitments, rejoining the international community, uh, and uh, seeing uh, a gradual uh, a progression in which uh, both security and prosperity for the people of uh, North Korea can be achieved. Uh, you know, if, if what North Korea has been doing has not resulted in a strong, prosperous nation, uh, then now's a good time for uh, Kim Jong-un to evaluate that history and uh, take a different path. Uh, and I think that should he choose to take a different path, uh, not only President Park and myself would welcome it, but the international community as a whole would welcome it. Uh, and I think that uh, China uh, and Russia and Japan and other key players uh, that have been participants in six-party talks have made that clear. But there's going to have to be changes in behavior. Uh, you know, we have an expression in, in English, uh, you know, uh, don't, don't, don't worry about uh, what I say, uh, watch what I do. And we're 
so far at least we haven't seen actions uh, on the part of uh, the North Koreans that would indicate uh, they're prepared to, to move in a different direction. Um, Christy Parsons. Thank you, Mr. President. The Pentagon said today that there may be as many as 70 sexual assaults a day in the military, up by 35% during your term in office, and also that many sexual assaults may not be reported, in fact. Given what we know about an Air Force officer in charge of preventing sexual assault, recently being charged with sexual assault, and also the recent cases of a couple of Air Force generals who've set aside convictions of instances of sexual assault, can you speak to the culture in the U.S. military that may be at play here and talk about your response to that and what you can do going forward to improve things? And if I may, President Park, I would ask you, yesterday you said that if North Korea does not change its behavior, we will make them pay. I wondered if you could elaborate on that comment a little bit. Thank you. Uh, well, let's start with the principle that uh, sexual assault is an outrage. Uh, it is a crime. Uh, that's true for society at large, and if it's happening, uh, inside our military, then uh, whoever carries it out uh, is betraying uh, the uniform that they're wearing. Uh, and they may consider themselves patriots, but when you engage in this kind of behavior, uh, that's not patriotic. Uh, it's a crime. And we have to do everything we can to root this out. Now, uh, this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do is create a structure in which we're starting to get accurate reporting. And up and down the chain, uh, we are seeing uh, a process, a system of accountability and transparency so that we can root this out uh, completely. Uh, and this is a discussion that I had with Secretary Panetta. He had begun the process of uh, moving this forward. Uh, but I have directly spoken to Secretary Hagel already today uh, and indicating to him that uh, we're going to have to, you know, not just step up our game, we have to exponentially step up our game to go at this thing hard. Uh, and for those who are in uniform, uh, who've experienced sexual assault, I want them to hear directly from their commander in chief that I've got their backs, I will support them, and we're not going to tolerate this stuff, and there will be accountability. If people have engaged in this behavior, they should be prosecuted. And anybody in the military who has knowledge of this stuff should understand this is not who we are. This is not what uh, the U.S. military is about. Uh, and it dishonors uh, the vast majority of men and women in uniform who carry out uh, their responsibilities and obligations uh, with honor and dignity uh, and incredible courage. Uh, every single day. So bottom line is, I have no tolerance for this. Uh, I have communicated this to the Secretary of Defense. We're going to communicate uh, this uh, again to folks up and down the chain uh, in, uh, in areas of authority. Uh, and I expect consequences. So, so I don't want just more speeches uh, or uh, you know, awareness programs or training, but ultimately folks look the other way. If we find out somebody's engaging in this stuff, they've got to be held accountable, prosecuted, stripped of their positions, court martial, fired, dishonorably discharged, period. Uh, it's not acceptable. Regarding North Korea's provocations and bad behavior, we will make them pay. With regard to that, for instance, what I meant was that if they engage in military provocations and harm the lives of our people and the safety of our people, then naturally, as, I, as president who gives the top priority to ensuring the safety of our people, it is something that we, can adjust, we can't just pass over. So if North Korea engages in provocations, 
I will fully trust the judgment of our military. So if our military makes a judgment which they feel is the right thing, then they should act accordingly. And this is the instruction that I had made. And North Korea has to pay a price when it comes not only with regard to provocations, but also with regard to the recent k a e s o n g Industrial Complex issue, where based on agreements between the two sides, companies had believed in the agreement that was made and actually went to invest in the k a e s o n g Industrial Complex, but they suddenly completely dismiss and disregard this agreement overnight. And deny various medical supplies and food supplies to Korean citizens left in that industrial complex, refusing to accept our request to allow in those supplies, which is what prompted us to withdraw all of our citizens from that park. This situation unfolded in the full view of the international community. So who would invest not to mention Korean companies, but also companies of other countries, who would invest in North Korea in a place that shows such flagrant disregard for agreements? And how could they, under those circumstances, actually pull off economic achievement? So I think in this regard, they're actually paying the price for their own misdeeds. I am Oil Man from Seoul newspaper. My question goes to President Obama. President um, Park has been talking about the Korean Peninsula trust building process as a way to promote peace on the Korean Peninsula. I wonder what you feel about this trust building process on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, well, as I indicated before, uh, President Park's uh, approach is very compatible with uh, my approach and the approach uh, that we have been taking together uh, for several years now. And as I understand it, uh, the, the key is that we will be prepared for deterrence, that we will uh, respond to aggression, that we will uh, not reward provocative actions, but that we will maintain an openness to uh, a an engagement process when we see North Korea taking uh, steps that would indicate uh, that it is uh, following a different path. Uh, and, and that's uh, exactly the right approach. All of us would benefit from uh, a North Korea that uh, transformed itself. Uh, certainly, the people of North Korea would benefit. Uh, South Korea would be uh, even stronger uh, in a less uh, uh, tense uh, environment on the peninsula. All the surrounding neighbors uh, would welcome uh, such, a, uh, such a transition, such a transformation. Uh, but uh, I don't think uh, either uh, President Park uh, or I are naive about the difficulties of that taking place, and we've got to Uh, see action uh, uh, before uh, you know, we, we can have confidence that that, in fact, is, uh, is the path that uh, uh, North Korea intends to take. Uh, but the one thing I want to emphasize, uh, just based on uh, the excellent meetings uh, and consultation that we had today, uh, as well as uh, watching uh, President Park uh, over the last several months uh, dealing with uh, the Uh, provocative escalations that have been taking place uh, uh, in North Korea. Uh, what I'm very confident about is uh, President Park is tough. Uh, I think she has a very clear, realistic view of the situation. Uh, but she also has the wisdom to believe that uh, conflict uh, is not inevitable uh, and is not preferable. Uh, and that's true on the Korean Peninsula. That's true uh, around the world. And uh, we very much uh, appreciate her visit and look forward to uh, excellent cooperation, not only on this issue, but on 
the more positive issues of economic uh, and, and commercial uh, ties between our two countries, ex educational exchanges, uh, work on energy, climate change, uh, helping other countries develop. You know, I've had a wonderful time every time I've visited uh, the Republic of Korea, and what is clear is that uh, the Republic of Korea is one of the great uh, success stories of our lifetime. And, uh, you know, the Republic of Korea's leadership around the globe uh, it will be increasingly important. Uh, and what underpins that, uh, in part, uh, has been the extraordinary history of the alliance between the United States uh, and the Republic of Korea. And uh, we want to make sure that that remains a strong foundation for progress in the future. So thank you so much, Madam President.